So I was at my friend John's the other day, and he was playing a AAA video game, which supported HDR, on a PS5, which supports HDR, on a TV that supports HDR. But he had HDR turned off, because it just didn't look good. Now we tried every setting we could find, we even swapped cables, but there was nothing that we could find that made the game stably look good. It would look good in sections, but then you'd play the game and the scene would change and it would look awful. Raise your hand if you've had a similar experience. Actually, don't bother, I can't see you. But as we talk to creators about making HDR videos, we find that this is usually the blocking issue. They find HDR will look worse on a device than SDR would, and they don't know how to fix it. I believe there's a simple reason at the heart of this. HDR is too powerful, and to make it useful for people, we have to make it less powerful. You might have seen a chart like this. It shows that SDR has a small luminance range, that HDR has a bigger one, but that the human eye's dynamic range is just astounding. In perfect conditions, a human can see bursts of as little as 10 photons at the lowest end, and compared to a full daylight, that's a trillion to one contrast ratio. Now that's true, but misleading. The chart gives the impression that HDR isn't nearly powerful enough. But the thing is, the human eye can't see this all at once. The instantaneous range is about here, 10 stops, or a thousand to one contrast ratio, about the same as a modern SDR display. To go from here to here is a chemical process called dark adaptation, and it can take hours. Natural scenes have a contrast ratio that significantly exceeds that thousand to one number. So if your eye can't see all that contrast, how is it capable of taking in a vista like this? And for that matter, how can you see it on your SDR screen without a bunch of obvious clipping? Well, the startling answer is, you don't actually see the scene, not directly at least, you hallucinate it. Here's a classic optical illusion. You can see that the patch of color labeled A is a very different color than the one labeled B. But if you connect the two, you see that they're the same physical intensity. This illusion shows us a few things about the human visual system that are confirmed by research. First, our brain isn't a measurement instrument. It's built to tell us not what's real or what's accurate, but what we need to survive. The predictive processing model is a compelling model of neural organization, and it suggests, as far as I can tell, that we're basically hallucinating our entire experience all the time. What we see is what we think we see. It's just a prediction. Our sensory inputs guide that prediction, but they don't impact what we see directly. It's all through the model. Second, the brain isn't even trying to model absolute luminance values. It's trying to model objects and their properties. The reflectance values of objects have a dynamic range that's much lower than the absolute luminance values that you find in natural scenes. Most of the world just isn't Vanta black and disco balls. If you find an object that we perceive of as black, it usually has a reflectance value in the neighborhood of 5%. Third, the brain has a really strong opinion of the way light and shadow works. The eye doesn't even see in absolute terms. With the information that the optic nerve transmits is actually contrast information at a local scale. The brain's receiving all that information and integrating it across multiple scales to rebuild the scene. Its understanding of the way light and shadow works is important to reconstructing those middle ranges and assigning values to objects. But larger scales, anomalies might just be ignored. I want to highlight that this is just bits of one theory of how human vision works, and the science here is far from settled. We know our models of vision are incomplete. At the micro-benchmarking level, different models make falsifiable predictions, and no model is perfect at explaining everything. Also, I'm not an expert in any of this, I'm just summarizing papers I read. Still, there's enough consensus here to make useful conclusions for video engineering. For instance, here's a photo I took in RAW. Sorry, it's not actually a video, long story. Both the trees and the distant valleys in this scene were clearly visible in person, but in the photo the trees are too dark. But apply an operator over a big enough scale and you can rebalance the scene to tell a better story, even if it's less literal. Your brain doesn't notice the big distortion line because it doesn't map to a physical explanation. Similarly, your brain is so eager to believe in physical things that even tremendously sloppy interventions that look like they could be the result of real light get accepted. HDR is capable of reproducing a larger dynamic range than SDR, obviously, and so you could choose to convey the same scene with less dynamic range compression. But there are downsides to being more literal about how you grade a scene. The first one is, on a screen, the viewer's eye is immediately drawn towards bright spots. 
I haven't seen research papers on this, but my experience is that there's something about an emissive display that makes a viewer immediately go stare at a sun in a way that they would never do outside. And this is worse in HDR. Maybe it's the fact that everything's in the same focal plane, maybe it's the sheer nature of an all emissive scene, which isn't something you ever find in nature. But if your goal is to try and tell a story, it's very disruptive to have random surfaces throughout your scene pulling the viewer's eye away from the intended subjects. Another thing you can do in HDR in a way that's more realistic, but way more annoying, is to transition from a bright shot to a really dark one. For one thing, the eye takes a few seconds to physically adapt to lower light, and that's just for the quick stuff like dilating the pupils, that doesn't count the chemical stuff. And if the viewer is in a brighter ambient environment, the image is going to be washed out by reflectivity on the display. But even worse than that is going from really dark to really bright, because that kind of transition can be physically painful. And this talk is an SDR, so you gotta just trust me. If you really punch it in HDR, you can actually make the audience physically flinch. Is inflicting pain on your viewers considered immersive? Absolutely. Is it, you know, good? Well, that's for you to decide. But the BBC published guidelines that suggest creators should stick to a much narrower range of average scene luminances than HDR supports so that you don't annoy your audience. And that's consistent with feedback from end users. Early on in HDR, colorists really swung for the fences here and got a lot of pushback from viewers who thought they took it too far. It's not a problem exclusive to HDR. Remember that really dark episode of Game of Thrones? But it was pretty natural to assume that enhanced technical capabilities of HDR should be used to create these order of magnitude scene transitions until we tried it and found out it was annoying. Let's be clear though, we're mostly talking here about average scene light levels. HDR, the full range of HDR, absolutely rocks for emissive stuff like special effects, where it serves a storytelling purpose, and where you arrange your grade to deliver the impact without physically hurting your viewers. So let me show you exactly what I mean when I say that HDR is too powerful. And buckle in folks, because you are absolutely about to watch a video of a video of Big Buck Bunny. I've got my camera pointed at a Pro Display XDR. The camera's auto exposure is on, so much like the human visual system, it's automatically adjusting for changes in the absolute luminance values, just way faster. Now I'm increasing the brightness by 10x. After a quick flash, you can see that the image is almost unchanged. If that didn't absolutely blow you away, here's a reference point. Let's do the same trick with a 10-year-old SDR TV. I've sped it up for your sake. We see that the shadows are super crushed in the dark version, and the highlights are blown out in the bright one. Let's do one last demo. I really want to drive this point home. I'm in a comfortably lit office. The camera's exposure locked this time, and I'm go just going to take the brightness on this Pro Display XDR and turn it from its lowest setting to its brightest. And take a look at my face as this happens. And that's why John's video game didn't look good in HDR. Okay, I guess we need to connect the dots before that makes sense. When I'm in my makeshift color suite, that professional display was absolutely dominating what I saw. There was almost no competing light source, and the thing is massively powerful. It has almost unlimited control over my optic response. But in real world situations, my screen might not be as good, or there might be a lot of ambient competing illumination, or both. Something is going to need to decide how to compress the massive theoretical range from the color suite down to something that works on a device in the situation that you want to watch. In SDR, the decisions about what to prioritize are solved back in the color suite. The narrow limitations of SDR intrinsically guide colorists, professional and amateur alike, to place their scenes where the most important parts are in the area where it just looks good. Now, if you're a professional colorist working on a film with a huge budget, you have some resources at your disposal. For one thing, you probably know other colorists. The professional network will help guide your sense of style and taste to arrive at a convention pretty much organically. Another thing is you probably spend a lot of time watching HDR films, paying attention to how the color grading works so that you can see what works where and what doesn't. Finally, you can just tell devices what to prioritize. If your budget's big enough, you can buy access to a high-end color grading rig that includes support for explicitly authoring dynamic metadata. This helps consumer devices understand exactly what the intention behind a scene is and map it accordingly. It produces fantastic results, but the process is expensive and it's time consuming. But what happens if you're in the middle? 
you've just gained access to a rig that's capable of shooting and grading HDR, and you get in a darkened room just like the pros. And then you import your first clip, and your eyes adapt to that. You import your next clip and start adjusting it so that it looks good against your first clip back to back, and so on. Maybe the whole timeline comes together without ever realizing that the average content light level is a choice, because in your dim ambient grading environment, your HDR hardware is good enough that nearly any choice will look reasonable. Not this one though, this one's garbage. In other words, for most non-blockbuster content, the average light level of a given program has a ton of arbitrary variation, because there are no intrinsic constraints on the light level provided by the creative environment. And this variation is arbitrary because it doesn't have a real storytelling purpose. We've already talked about how audiences don't enjoy big abrupt changes in brightness, so you don't need to plan out a ton of headroom for 10x variations, and you don't need to reserve space for uncomfortably bright clouds and sunsets and stuff, because being natural can distract from storytelling. So anywhere your content fits within the color grading display's capabilities, one choice will appear just as good as another. But so much viewing happens in conditions that are less than ideal. In HDR without dynamic metadata, right now it's left up to the display to just guess what is the most important part of that massive HDR histogram, and adjust the rendering to prioritize that region. Different displays do this in different ways. Some of them apply relatively simple rules regardless of content, and these tend to be pretty stable. But a lot try to cook up a content adaptive approach. They look at a histogram of the last few seconds of video, use that to make a guess as to what the most important parts of the histogram are, and then adjust their local tone mapping to prioritize it. This is often called dynamic contrast. But the problem for a creator is this algorithm is constantly fighting you. Sure, it helps present two programs that have a massive arbitrary difference in average light level on the same TV without changing settings. But it also means that if you want to use a small and reasonable change in light level for storytelling purposes within a program, the TV is going to fight you because it doesn't know the difference between an intentional choice and an arbitrary one and it doesn't know the boundaries between programs. There's no standard for this. There are dozens of very different implementations. This system of dynamic contrast solves a real problem, but the problem doesn't need to exist. It's just a consequence of there being no formal feedback within the creative environment about that first arbitrary decision, about how to grade the first shot within a program. I have a proposal, and given the complexity of the things we talked about, it's almost embarrassing how simple the proposal is. Although simple is kind of the whole point, Want to hear it? I don't care. I still can't hear you. I'm telling you anyway. Defaults. That's it. That's the proposal. In particular, by default when grading HDR, the user should be shown the SDR down conversion in real time. And the SDR down conversion should be by default be done with the same LUT everywhere across every app. A LUT is short for a lookup table, and it's just a file that describes a static way to remap image content. LUTs are probably the simplest and most common way to convert between standards, like from SDR to HDR and back. Showing users a LUT-based SDR down conversion while they grade HDR would serve as a constraint on the arbitrary parameters in the HDR environment. An HDR program will only look good without LUT applied when its average light levels fall within a given range. Not a super tight range, allowing for variations in service of storytelling, but still much tighter than the orders of magnitude that's possible without a real constraint aside from the capabilities of the grading display. This would guide creators towards having less arbitrary program-to-program -program variation. Over time, end-user HDR devices won't have to use dynamic contrast to get images that look good in suboptimal conditions. They can rely on simple, static rules. And if they do that, then the smaller intentional variations in light levels will behave predictably across devices, and creators will be happier with how their content looks in more places. Whether a user sticks with the default LUT, chooses from some other presets that have similar implicit expectations of the HDR tone range, or just swaps in a custom one, they can send that LUT to, say, streaming platforms, embedded within the HDR video file. Then they'll know exactly what the SDR down conversion will look like. Over the years, these defaults will spider out to different parts of the HDR ecosystem, like the auto exposure in phone cameras that shoot HDR, and the shaders used in video game engines. Okay, a few closing thoughts. One is obviously this is not a proposal for the highest ends of the market. If you listen to this talk and you already knew everything we talked about, please go continue making beautiful films with large budgets. But that segment also doesn't need something like this, because for full-time colorists, social networks serve to generate and instill the norms about how to grade tastefully. 
That force is what I think is missing from the semi-pro segment. Second, the actual proposal is just one way to try to guide users toward producing better HDR. Product folks, if you've got better ideas, please go implement those. Also, this kind of intervention will take years before it has a complete effect. A TV maker probably won't be able to fully disable dynamic contrast, even if the strategy gives room for it to be less aggressive over time. But HDR is here to stay, and as it stands, it's way too difficult to implement HDR and make it both predictable and beautiful across all current content using a stack of purely open technologies. Hopefully a simple intervention like this can help. Thank you.